Hi, everyone. My name is Erica Greenberg, and I'm the director of the Pediatric Psychiatry OCD and Tick Disorders Program here at Mass General. And I'm going to be talking about OCD, ticks, and related disorders, and possible um, theoretical uh, connection with sunflower syndrome. So thank you for having me today. <clears throat> so um, obsessive compulsive disorder is part of the obsessive compulsive and related disorders um, category in the DSM. And along with it there are also trichotillomania, hair pulling disorder, excoriation, uh, or skin picking disorder, uh, known as body focused repetitive behavior disorders. Uh, those are also in the obsessive compulsive related disorders um, category. And then the uh, other topic I'll be speaking about tick disorders that's in its own um, neurodevelopmental category, but um, either way has a lot of links with OCD. And so what is obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD? So it's um, uh, characterized by both obsessions and compulsions. So obsessions are intrusive and unwanted thoughts, images, or urges that occur over and over again um, and outside of one's control. And they often lead to feelings of anxiety uh, and distress uh, or disgust. And compulsions are behaviors that the individual feels that they must do with the intention of getting rid of those unwanted feelings caused by the obsession or to stop something bad from happening. Um, often children who have um, compulsions can't necessarily articulate the aims. They just say, um, I, I don't know, I had to do it. <clears throat> and so in order to define um, criteria, uh, the symptoms need to take at least an hour a day, so somewhat time consuming, and they need to cause clinically significant uh, distress uh, or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of function. It also can't be secondary to a substance, medical condition, or other mental disorder. And when we're looking at subtypes or, or um, specifiers, sorry, related to OCD, uh, there's two that are listed. There's insight, um, which can either be good or fair, meaning that the individual um, realizes that what they're thinking, um, you know, if, if I don't tap this three times, someone will get hurt. They, you know, they realize that it's not true or probably not true, um, even though they feel compelled to act on um, the, the obsessions anyway. Uh, poor insight is, you know, thinking that maybe these beliefs actually are pretty true. And then there's absent uh, insight or delusional, and that's when the individual is convinced that these are true. And, and most often um, one sees good or fair insight, uh, though it's important to not note in kids, um, the insight level isn't necessarily static and then varies with the anxiety levels. The other important specifier, uh, and the one that we'll focus more on today, is tick related. And so this is whether the individual with OCD has either current or a history of ticks, which is probably in about 20% um, of those with OCD, more common in um, uh, youth. And so this is a list of various uh, obsessions and compulsions that are most common. Um, so there's contamination, uh, or, or worried about um, being dirty, that could be, you know, concretely, physically dirty, that could be morally contaminated. Um, there's fear of bad things happening. Uh, intrusive thoughts, so these might be aggressive thoughts uh, or moral or sexual thoughts that often um, feel uh, confusing to the person. I don't know why I'm thinking this, I don't want to do it but it's popping in my head and I can't stop it. So does that mean it's real? And that's sort of how that, that symptom often goes. Especially in kids, there's often an urge to uh, confess um, uh, you know, every detail uh, about um, something that they may or may not have done. Magical thinking, which is basically, if I do this, then this will happen, even though those aren't necessarily uh, linked in, in real life. Uh, and symmetry and just right. And so that's often described as a feeling of not just right. And so it's it's not that they're afraid something will happen. It's, it's this feeling of, I just have to do it. It doesn't feel right if I don't. And then similarly, compulsions, washing, cleaning, 
repeating, rewriting, particularly in school, touching, tapping, ordering, arranging, counting, checking, reassurance seeking. That's a really big one often in kids. Um, and then mental rituals, which you might not see, but the person experiences. So um, sort of having to check within themselves um, regarding uh, whether certain things did or did not happen. And um, it's interesting because we can divide these symptoms into categories uh, and, and subgroups. And so the three big ones, hoarding used to be included, but that's no longer um, part of OCD. Uh, the three big ones now are contamination cleaning. So again, that's, that's the one you often see in, in more of the lay public. Then there's that forbidden thoughts category that I was describing, those intrusive thoughts, often um, sexual, aggressive, uh, moral, uh, in nature. Um, and then that is sometimes divided into these, again, these taboo thoughts, um, sometimes even those being um, impulsive aggressive urges. So I had an urge to push someone. Um, I don't know why I thought that. I don't want to. I don't want to hurt anyone, but I had that urge. Uh, and then um, doubting. And so that one involves more of um, uh, a lot of checking. Did I um, did I hit something while I was driving? Did I hurt something? And then either um, checking yourself, reassurance seeking, et cetera. So that's more in that forbidden thought category. And then the final category that I touched on is symmetry. And so again, that's the things needing to feel just right um, or um, uh, just a feeling of it being not just right and needing things um, uh, to feel even. Uh, so it's also associated with evening it up, evening up, ordering, counting, et cetera. And it's helpful to ask what is driving the compulsion? Um, so it could be fear. Like I mentioned, if I don't do this, something bad will happen, but it could also be disgust. Um, and again, this not just right feeling. And so this slide highlights um, the difference between what's typical uh, childhood developmental behavior and what's actually obsessive compulsive disorder as a syndrome. Uh, as a rule, typical developmentally appropriate behaviors don't impair family functioning. Um, and if one interrupts the, the rituals or the compulsions, it, it doesn't lead to severe distress in the child. Uh, so there's just a helpful chart. And then um, regarding characteristics, we know that it's about two to three percent prevalence in children and adolescents. It has a bimodal onset. And so the first one is more early onset average age around 10, maybe a little older for females presentation. Um, and then the secondary onset is often in late teens or early adulthood. The younger onset, the one that I more often see in my practice uh, is, um, is again that, that younger group. And interestingly, that has a more genetic or heritable um, picture uh, associated with it uh, compared to the older group. Uh, and it's also more associated with tick disorders. In that early age group, a little bit more prevalent in boys compared to girls. And again, it's, it's 10, you know, plus or minus, often right before puberty or peripubertal onset. And um, what we know about OCD is that it's commonly associated with other conditions. Uh, so at least um, over 50% of youth with OCD will have at least one co-occurring condition, most commonly being other, um, conditions in the obsessive compulsive category, uh, like the body focused repetitive behavior disorders or anxiety, uh, anxiety spectrum disorders, tics, as I mentioned, um, ADHD is very commonly associated with OCD uh, and um, depression mood disorders. The course, it tends to wax and wane with time, kind of on its own. Uh, we know that symptoms are impacted by the environment, meaning if someone is sick, really tired, hungry, you might see increased symptoms, but this waxing and waning is more independent of that. And um, we, um, in general, it has a pretty um, good prognosis in that about 50% uh, of youth remit over time, or at least are, are uh, have subclinical symptoms or are symptom free when checked in on seven to 12 years later, that might still be with ongoing treatment. Um, and we know that about 70% of children respond to um, our first line treatments. Regarding those treatments, they include behavioral therapy, uh, which is mainly cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, and then also exposure response prevention, which is a type of CBT 
where um, the individual is exposed to the feared um, or exposed to something that provokes the obsession and then uh, works with the therapist to prevent the compulsion. And um, in terms of medications, the FDA approved medications, uh, gold standard treatment are selective serotonergic reuptake inhibitors, including uh, fluoxetine, sertraline, and fluvoxamine, and a tricyclic antidepressant um, known as clomipramine. Really, any of the SSRIs um, uh, are likely to be effective it, um, in OCD, but these are the ones that are FDA approved. And um, you know, the combination of medication and therapy is what's most helpful. And we often expect to see 30 to 40% reduction in symptoms. Um, and usually that starts within the first couple weeks with about two thirds of the changes seen in the first two to four weeks. And so now I'm gonna speak briefly about tick disorders. So what are tick disorders or tics? Tics are sudden, abrupt, recurrent and stereotyped non-rhythmic um, movements and or sounds. Um, they're thought to be involuntary, not involuntary, meaning happening against one's will, or voluntary, meaning controlled deliberate choice of action, but somewhere in the middle or involuntary, like an irresistible urge or a terrible itch or sneeze. And I really liked this quote describing them, voluntary movements made automatically so that volition is not ordinarily appreciated. They tend to wax and wane, they come in bouts, they jump in uh, location, frequency, type, complexity, severity. And they're often preceded by this um, urge, we call a premonitory urge, which is a somatic or sensory feeling that precedes the tics, like an itch, a tension, uh, an incompleteness, not just right feeling. And you can hear the similarity here to compulsions in, in OCD. And this is temporarily relieved by performing the tick. Um, again, like OCD, we know that uh, ticks are particularly vulnerable to modifying factors uh, environmentally or, or internally. So different mood states um, or, or different, you know, first day of school, trip to Disney World. Those are all things that can exacerbate ticks. And um, we tend to break them down into a two by two chart. Um, motor tics, meaning um, involving muscle groups uh, or muscles, uh, and then phonic or vocal tics, meaning um, producing sound. That's then broken down into simple and complex, simple meaning um, just one muscle group um, or, or a simple sound such as sniffing, coughing, uh, and then the more complex, which is uh, coordinated um, uh, often uh, multiple muscle groups uh, and uh, repeated, you know, series of movements and sounds done in the same way uh, repeatedly. And so, um, you know, these often appear slower, purposeful, uh, but again, that doesn't mean that they're deliberate voluntary. And um, often people speak about corpulalia, the swearing tick, uh, that, that's actually only about 15% in those with Tourette syndrome. And so now that we spoke about tics, what's Tourette syndrome? Well, Tourette is a childhood onset neuropsychiatric disorder characterized by tics. And so to meet criteria for Tourette, it's, it's relatively straightforward. You need at least two motor tics and one vocal tic for at least a year before age 18, about 1% prevalence. Um, there's other um, tic disorders, but I'll mainly focus on Tourette. And um, before I move on, I want to talk about the overlapping pathophysiology commonly associated with both OCD and tics, uh, and then any of the following conditions that I'll discuss. Uh, and so these disorders are associated with um, dysfunction in the frontal cortical, striatal thalamo cortical, or CSTC for short, circuits. And um, they, uh, this leads to, when they're disrupted, disinhibition of motor movement and limbic emotion regulation system and um, uh, dysregulation in movements, motivation, emotion. Uh, and, and so this circuitry consists of parallel interconnected loops where depending on the area impacted, as you'll see on the next slide, you'll see different symptom manifestations. And so one might see OCD, 
Um, as I mentioned, one might see ticks. And then another very related condition that's also associated with this loop is uh, ADHD and or executive functioning uh, deficits. And so this is just that further illustration of the circuit. Um, you can see how depending on the part of the uh, cortex implicated, one might um, uh, have tics, ADHD, and or OCD. And they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, they're often co-occurring. And um, so what the circuit is also implicated in is impulsive compulsive spectrum disorders. Uh, I'm often asked to differentiate between impulsive and compulsive, and it's, it can be very helpful and important to do so. Impulsive or impulsivity, that's reward seeking. That means failing to inhibit a behavior that's motivated by reward. Uh, I'm on a diet and I really want a cookie and I take it and I eat it, I just can't stop myself. Compulsivity is sort of the inverse. It's discomfort reducing. Uh, and it's failing to suppress behaviors that are designed to relieve tension or distress. So like in compulsions. So if one has um, a, a compulsion to tap something to make sure something bad doesn't happen, not being able to stop themselves from tapping. And, and regarding the circuitry, um, uh, lots of different um, pathophysiological um, uh, causes, but often speculated to have either some combination of top-down cortical disinhibition uh, or, or um, decreased inhibitory processes within the circuit. That's a little more beyond the scope, and I defer to Dr. Thiel regarding uh, more in-depth on the circuitry. And then the last condition I wanted to speak about commonly associated with that um, uh, circuitry is body focused repetitive behaviors, hair pulling, skin picking, causing distress and inability to stop, um, and, and you know, either bald spot or, or um, lesions on the skin, cheek biting, uh, severe nail biting, uh, often studied in an OCD population and higher rates in OCD and in Tourette compared to typical populations. And really strong genetic relationship between OCD, BFRBs, and ticks. Um, you know, they have a relationship both genetically, pathophysio pathophysiologically, as I just mentioned with that circuit, and clinically. And um, uh, they're all um, uh, they all have components of repetitive, impulsive, compulsive symptoms. Um, and this overlapping pathophysiology, as I mentioned, is attributed to the frontal striatal or the CSTC circuitry dysfunction, dysregulated habit formation, and impaired inhibition of motor response. So lots of dysregulation, um, disinhibition. Moving on, there's a condition called teretic OCD, um, and... Uh, this was coined in 2005. It's associated with male gender or male sex, uh, earlier OCD age of onset, worse OCD, sensory difficulties, ADHD, impulse disorders, skin picking, anxiety. So again, lot, lots of those uh, symptoms that I mentioned as also related to OCD and, and or the CSTC um, profile. And what's interesting is it has common um, particular OCD symptoms. And so in youth that have OCD and co-occurring tics, we often see particular subgroups of OCD symptoms um, presented. And that's those intrusive thoughts that I was speaking about, the um, distressing, uh, aggressive, or um, intrusive thoughts, urges. Um, and then also the symmetry, not just right um, checking, tapping, writing, rewriting, even in compulsions. Um, but again, this, this subgroup is um, often particularly reports that their symptoms are not necessarily fear-based, but driven by these not just right feelings, uh, sensation or feeling of incompleteness driving the symptoms. And, and when you ask why they do it, they don't say they're afraid of something bad happening. They say, I, if I don't, I, I'm going to explode. I, I can't explain why. I just have to. I have to. And so it's really challenging to sort out what's a complex tick what's a compulsion. Um, and what's also interesting is through generic, genetic studies, looking at uh, an array of these symptoms, uh, we've become aware of cross disorder endophenotypes. And so there's a heritable and inherited what's called disinhibition endophenotype seen um, in a large Tourette and family sample. And this is associated mostly with OCD, 
with a positive correlation um, with ADHD and Tourette. And, and in this heritable phenomenon, you see characteristics of tics, OCD, ADHD, but particularly increased um, obscene rude gestures or corporopraxia, corporalia, aggressive intrusive images, uh, et cetera. And so we call this the, the disinhibition endophenotype. And so finally, um, this leads me to the final concept that I wanted to discuss today called IDBs or intrusive destructive behaviors. So this construct came from a study I was conducting on behavioral treatment for tics, where the participants often had a combination of tics, OCD, ADHD executive dysfunction, amongst other conditions. And they described this phenomenon where they felt um, compelled to perform certain behaviors despite awareness of the negative implications. And so they described the experience as beginning with an intrusive, distressing thought urge specific to the environment, an inability to shift away from that thought, followed by increased distress, trying to resist this thought urge, and then ultimately letting go and engaging in the behavior, which leads um, to paradoxically negative but satisfying consequence. And, and so these behaviors um, we think of as being simultaneously deliberate, satisfying, and upsetting to the individual engaging in them. And they can be really confusing um, as to why it might look like someone is doing this. But again, I heard this over and over in this subset of, um, of youth that have these related conditions. And, and so I've been wondering about the link with that CSTC circuitry. And so some examples involve pushing on a bruise. Um, if they just build something they're really proud of, having to knock it down, having to turn off a video game just before they're about to win, um, licking a dirty sink. And, and one that I hear often for those that are athletes, um, essentially having a self-sabotage component where right before they're about to win like a swim race, breathing in air. And so given my understanding of sunflower syndrome and, and the, the being drawn towards the, the environmental factor that, that leads to the seizure, um, Dr. Teal and I were interested in whether there might be a link. And so uh, I'm sorry I can't be here today, but thank you and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks.